Cool. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. So they're dropping you at the table without introducing you. Marco Siega, uh, director, executive producer. May I just say that was the creepiest pilot I have ever seen, and I kept sitting there thinking, I can't believe this is on network TV. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is network TV. I can't look. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is on network TV. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say that the show is incredibly well paced, and you have so much going on in the script, but at the same time, you don't force it, which I liked. And when you have so much juicy stuff, and we know there's serial killers around the corner, there's always the desire to want to push it. But just everything just was well plotted and well pleased with the acting and directing and just cinematography, everything. Well done. Well, thank you. I don't know if there's a question there. There wasn't. I'm trying <laughs> to get a question. Thank you so much. I have a question for you. Yes. Going, did you have any reluctance um, sort of drawing water from this well after projects that you had done before, something like Dexter, that have, you know, such a specific sort of identity to them. What did you think that you could bring to this sort of genre with this, this show? Uh, it, was, it was actually quite easy to separate myself from Dexter because Dexter is more, for me, more of a graphic novel. There's a, a heightened sense of reality and it's shot more like a graphic novel. It's very... Um, wide lenses and the style was so different. When Kevin Kevin came up with this uh, as a feature 15 years ago and when we were doing Vampire Diaries we had talked about it and we said if this ever happens one of the things that we probably strive to do is, is ground it in, in reality and as much as you can because you're always going to hit for storytelling purposes it's going to be somewhat absurd but if you can make the audience feel like you know, these are real people, they're not superheroes, um, if the style can represent that in some way. So, you know, it's a very, it's a very organic feeling show, and I thought that was something that I strive to do for it that worked, that was successful. Who came up with the idea of, kind of, having the Ravens be? That's Kevin, I mean, it's a, that, it's a big part of the mythology. Um, like I said, Kevin, 15 years ago, had this idea, and it started, what you're seeing, that premise of the pilot uh, was really the premise of this feature film that he wrote. And it continues, Edgar Allan Poe and literature continues to be a, a thread throughout the series. And uh, you'll get little pieces of it. And it won't get tiring, because it's not specific to the Raven, it's not specific to anything. But it's just, I think it's really smart. Kevin pulls from literature. Joe Carroll is a professor of literature. Um, it's going to be embedded into some of uh, the clues that you'll find along the way and some of the, pe the other people that you'll meet along the way. Because he's one of my favorite authors. Yeah, it's great. Anything great creepy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> if you create a mythology, say, 15 years ago, do you then have to sort of change out stuff like something comes up in the interest, oh man, we can't use that anymore because he used it in, in this. So do you find that, that initial concept is as pure as it was then, or has it had to go through a lot of incarnations over the years? I mean, that'd be a better question for Kevin, but I do know that it's changed considerably because even the internet 15 years ago, um, I don't know how big of a uh, part of that story, of, I don't know how big that was in terms of his original concept. But it certainly plays a big part in our in our series. Um, it's not a techie show. It's not about the internet, but it's a tool that I think now, when audiences watch it, it goes, "Oh, it makes sense. You can do that. That's a reality." And it all goes back to sort of, can you make it feel real? Can you make it feel genuine? It's probably gone through a lot of changes, um, but I, I don't think in stale way. I'd probably think for the better. You said you've been working on it for a really long time. What does? Now being the right time, have anything to do with the rise of horror on TV and letting you push the boundaries a bit? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I think, um, you know, is, we never really thought, is it a right time? Like when we did Vampire Diaries, we thought maybe it's the wrong time because Twilight just came out. And um, this was just material driven. When I read it and Kevin said, I really, this is my next project, I'd love for you to do it. Um, it just felt like this is great. It's a great piece of material. It, things worry me. You know, when I read uh, an Aurora shooting in a movie theater, and then I think about the things we're doing on our show, those things concern me because you certainly don't want to um, put that out into the universe as a, an acceptable thing. Uh, but I, I think 
the violence aside, what hopefully people will respond to as you move forward to episodes two, three, four, and five, and onward, it's uh, if there's real human drama, and then you know we are a genre show and we deal with those things. But right time, I don't know. You know, hopefully it is. Hopefully it's the right time. The pilot focuses on Joe Carroll's ability to inspire these multiple serial killers. Yet at the same time, I see Kevin Bacon's character simultaneously able to inspire the junior tech agent who is watching him. Will we covertly see that unveil as the season continues? No, I think the opposite. You're going to get a lot of uh, Kevin Bacon, Ryan Hardy, Kevin Bacon's character, um, going against sort of what we the FBI just thinks should be happening. And, you know, he's he has his own way of working. Uh, Mike Weston, who plays, who's played by Sean Ashmore, studied the book that Hardy wrote. He knows a lot about the case, so he's more of a, um, you know, devotee to to him. But overall, I don't think that's that's a big part of it. Okay. And this is one of, for me personally, the most anticipated shows, new shows out there. Just talking about it, not till January. Was that is that a marketing strategy on your part? Is it all just kind of WB? Why wouldn't you know? Why did it a, not come out at the beginning? Well, thank you for saying that. We hope it's and people are into it, but uh, I think it's the right time for it because if we would have premiered in the fall, at this point we would have aired three episodes and then we'd be off the air for four because of uh, baseball, the elections. Yeah. And so when we were talking about it, and we came up with, we're only doing 15 episode seasons. We wanted to follow more of a, a cable format. So cable shows, if, if you're gonna watch Homeland, it's on every Sunday. You don't run into a Sunday where there's a baseball game on. We're gonna premiere January 21st, and what we've worked out with Fox is we will run every week on Monday at nine o'clock. At nine o'clock. Uh, you're not going to get preempted by baseball or, you know, barring some national event that changes everything, the goal is to run every episode in consecutive weeks. How many seasons are you planning ahead or in terms of the mythology and the art? Kevin has, uh, we've discussed two full seasons, but I think we could, I'd love for this to run as long as possible. You know, I, I do think that in what he has planned for the two seasons, can sustain more because you're going to learn about certain things. You're going to plant certain seeds that can grow into storylines. So you're setting up now things that could happen in the Abs last absolutely. episode of the second season. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm wondering about Joe Carroll, and maybe I'm thinking more about network TV where there's a procedure. And, you know, you have a serial killer for the first season, that's the arc, and then second season you have a new serial killer. Will we see Joe Carroll in the second season? I know. <laughs> well, you know, look, uh, I, James Purefoy is one of our leads, you know. Yeah. Um, it's how will you see Joe Carroll in yeah. the second season, you know. I think we'll, we'll surprise the audience with certain things, but we're meeting a lot of uh, his acolytes along the way, and some of them will rise, um, and some of them will perish, you know. But the ones that rise might be where you go with it. And, um, I do think it has the ability to sort of spread and sustain itself as well. Is it difficult to create moral ambiguity for your characters because it can't, you, you, you can't have the white knight and the villain, people are just going to tune out, but at the same time, if you have a villain, he has to have some qualities that people are going to think are interesting or compelling. Is that something you've had to play with a lot, or did some of that come from your actors? I think, honestly, it comes from uh, Kevin Williamson. He, he thinks about the, these things a lot. We, we talk about them. Uh, we probably get the most resistance from the network simply because they want the black and white. They want the night and shine. They, the note is always, can your, can your protagonist have a win in this episode? And the, I think the big um, challenge for Kevin Williamson is you can't have a win in every episode or else you're a procedural. Or else, and, and, and with the villain, you need the audience to fall in love with them in some way so that you want to tune in. And I hope that some people will get to episode, I just finished editing episode three, and I think you're going to walk away saying, I love Joe Carroll. You know, and that's kind of strange, you, you know. But, um, so it is a challenge, something we think about a lot, but I think we're fairly successful after it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.